We understand everyone is at a different place in their fitness journey. Most people come in with a handful of things they're really good at, but we all have a few movements that are holding us back. We want our athletes to have the ability to individualize their training to their specific needs, which is why we are excited to announce the addition of skill programs as part of TTT Compete. If you need help getting better at things like the snatch, clean and jerk, pistols, handstand walk, handstand push-ups, toes to bar, chest to bar, ring muscle-ups, or double-unders, go to trainingthinktank.com to learn more. What advice... And I think I know the answer to this, but what advice do you have for those younger athletes that are, six, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 that haven't transitioned into, is it, is it all revolving around the psychological side and, and how they approach the sport or what is, I'd what, say, what's the most important thing? For them? Yeah. I mean, I'd say uh, self-awareness, relationships, communication, like that's kind of the thing that I think is most important because at a real level, I don't think it's that complicated to learn how to snatch well or clean and jerk well if you're a pretty good young athlete. Like if, if you're not a super gifted person, then those skills are super hard to get. But if you're mobile and athletic and you did gymnastics for a couple of years and you've been training like, you know, athletically and you're, you know, somebody that's really going to compete at the CrossFit Games, the likelihood is you're one of the people that like other people don't like because you can just pick skills up. It's like, Oh, you learned how to handstand walk in a week. It's like, yeah, well, those like those are the people that end up being games athletes. Yeah, I had Alexis at the pool yesterday, and it. I told her it was annoying, and I I'm gonna apologize to her on the podcast because I didn't really mean annoying. Yeah. It's just I've worked with a lot of people, and I'll be like, Alexis, do this, and then does it exactly the way I'm like, yeah, it's easy. It takes other people like. Yeah. Weeks of drilling. <laughs> yeah. So that for an elite athlete is not what dictates good coaching. Because yeah. I would argue that if you have a talented enough athlete, they're going to get better in the gym almost no matter what you do. All, if you're doing everything wrong, they'll probably keep getting better because it's just like you're getting more reps and you're kind of untrained. And as you get more reps, you want to be better. So you're refining things and you're filming things for the sport because you have to film them to upload them. So I don't think it's the physical. I think it's the mental, emotional, like you got to be doing it long enough. You got to be able to overcome injuries. You got to know why you're doing what you're doing. You got to know when to take time off. You got to know when to fucking love yourself. Like this community is so good at the, um, like the yin and the yang, I feel like, uh, of a human is that you have like, you need challenge. You need to push your comfort zones. Cause if you, if you stick inside your comfort zone too long, you deteriorate, like don't exercise, get fatter, get stiffer, don't move. Like that's what happens if you don't do it. But if you don't take care of yourself and like we've talked about it as going inward before in podcasts, I remember with Mike and like Paul check and like the more, um, Eastern like relaxation and breathing and parasympathetic work and massage work. If you don't do that for yourself, you don't feed yourself and you don't take care of your emotional state where like, if you have this, underlying anxiety that you don't tell people about you don't share where it comes from and you don't investigate why it's so bad like why can you not be in a normal situation that other people can just do no so normally but you can go and you can slam your head and be at max heart rate and you can be completely comfortable and peaceful if you don't start to address those things and kind of create a unified sense of self that balances the push and the pull i think you just break yourself and it might take five years it might take seven years it might take whatever but people will inherently break mentally or physically. So I would say like focus on who you are, why you're doing it, who you're doing it with, why you want to do it, because that's the hardest thing to learn. That's what takes a lifetime to learn. Learning how to get your back squat up is going to take you a year. The other things like it never stops. Like you, you get to your forties and it's like, fuck, I thought I knew everything when I was there. And then you talk to people that they're 60 and you're like, that'll happen again. Like by the time you get to 60, you look back and be like, man, I thought I knew everything. And before that, I thought I knew everything. And now I realize I don't know anything. It's just an endless cycle. Yeah. It's just like a, the self-awareness process I feel like is the most important thing. So being surrounded in a culture that helps you develop who you are, not gives you a model for what you should be, but instead helps you look at yourself and be like, no, this is what I want to be. And accepts it. Like, whatever the fuck you want to be. Yeah, you want to be a champion? You want to be ooh. somebody? I was going to say right. su support structure. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Chris, you, you got a thought. Um, so I know that at the in the in going back to the beginning of the podcast, you said one of the differences between the higher level people and the lower and someone beginning is their self-awareness. Yeah. I got to imagine that that's on a spectrum and that even people at the highest level have work to do on their self-awareness. Yeah. But what are some of the big differences 
um, as far as how, uh, like, can you illustrate those to the people, like, um, where people are at on when they're yeah. a beginner versus when they're later stages? Yeah. I got how a good they both st- tackle those? I got a good story for it. So last year we're doing games prep. Caden missed out on going to semifinals, and Caden wanted more than nothing else to train with the CrossFit Games prep squad during the summer, which didn't really make sense because he was so sp- – small and needed to get stronger and he was yeah. coming off injuries and like I was like dude you don't need to be doing like multi-mile trail runs and sandbag lifts and this type of stuff like you need to be under a barbell but he came to a swim session and we talked about it and he's like yeah I think I'm like a middle tier games athlete in a swim now in the open water I live on the water in the lake I go out for long swims on a regular basis when I go with my friends I'm really fast so, and I was like a, a mid-tier games athlete like you mean in the teen division and he was like no a mid-tier games athlete so Travis is level well Travis is like a maybe upper quarter swimmer yeah, yeah. not like middle I, but hold like, on. is this the session remember? I filmed that's on YouTube yes okay hey some uh, yeah. I'll see if I can <laughs> yeah. link it in the description <laughs> yeah this dude got his butt whooped right dude he basically drowned and then he <laughs> left the session and was like i don't know that was the hardest thing that i ever had i guess i have a lot of work to do but like that's a lack of self-awareness showing up to a competition and looking at a workout and being like oh, i'm gonna crush this and like really like this is 85 percent of your one rep max that you got to cycle after running a mile and doing you know 50 burpees when you're not really good at burpees you sure this is a good workout but they don't know that type of stuff. Like your your understanding of who you are and what you're capable of and also what your competitors are capable of is low. Once you start to get up into that higher level, like Travis or Noah can look at a workout and be like, oh, this one's probably not going to be good for me. Here's going to be the bottleneck. Here's why I'm going to pace it. And they tell me their plan. And they also so, have a better sense of what the other people around them are yeah, going to be capable Yeah, like, of oh, yeah, like they would look at it and be like, oh, you know, strong, strong power thing. Like, oh, Jeff Adler is going to be really good at this. Or, you know, looking at it as a super high skill thing and being like, oh, this is a Noah workout. Like they all are aware of themselves in the context of their community. And I think that's what I mean by self-awareness, not the like, yes, the mental, spiritual, who you are, why you operate. Like you, I think you should do that. They matter. But from an athlete perspective, I was talking about that. So to your point, I've always had a suspicion that the thing that holds a lot of people back is that they don't have that self-awareness. Yeah. Uh, What do you think it is that, that keeps people spinning their wheels that they never take on the, steps to improve that self-awareness you know is it just because it's not sexy it's it's come in do the hard work that's the sexy part yeah. but actually having to you know kind of mimic a kobe Bryant type my mindset of yeah. you know following the details and and watching the video yeah. and learning about yourself what what, what is it that's holding the, them back i've been I, yeah I, you, I, yeah, I think you got a theory? i think there's a, a big factor that people don't they're not willing to accept responsibility for things. I think that's a big factor of it. So they'll go to a example, they go to a competition and they get, you know, they they get their ass handed to him in the swim workout. So Caden and like in, in Caden's case, maybe he did accept responsibility for that. Maybe I wasn't as good at this as I I thought I was. And and now he's getting better and I need to do more. But I feel like most people will be like, well, it was the, it was too choppy. And the, the swim, the programming was wrong. Programming was all bad. The swim was too long. And you know, there should have been more burpees in the middle of the workout. And like, so instead of, taking ownership for their perceived failure. I mean, yeah. that's really what it is. Yeah. Instead of taking ownership for it, they're like... Pass the blame off. <laughs> Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pointing the fingers in yeah. every other direction. I think that's a big component so of it. So what's some entry-level I, skills to, to develop that awareness? Well, hold on. I think I would agree with that. I'd say another thing that maybe precludes it is the nature of the sport itself. Mm. There are so many things you have to learn. Mm. There are so many skills you have to learn. You have to be ready to do so much training volume. So if you just look at it from a practical perspective and you say like, what is the physical workload that I have to be able to tolerate to be successful in this sport? You're talking about like six to eight hours a day. And a lot of the workouts themselves are so hard that they like kind of fuck your cognitive system up. Like they test military people on that. Like push you to your limits and then how good are you at making decisions like well, and so you just said six to eight hours a day what of training that? sorry of, tr- of hard the, physical training like yeah if you yeah. want to be like world class in the sport can we can we use this keep talking about this idea but talk but about the everyday it. warrior like okay. the people who are like in ttt compete or like you know, right. they're not trying to be the top level right. games because it, i think still it still works. goes to them too so. yeah so i'll 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 do the same analogy yeah, for yeah, that yeah. person S- 
somebody trains and they love CrossFit. They want to be competitive at CrossFit and they want to do it at a local comp. Like they want to go to Fittest Experience or Wadapalooza in the RX Intermediate Division. The total amount of volume over the course of that weekend is what probably an average person would do in two weeks. If you just added up like somebody that did some bodybuilding and strength training and was relatively active and healthy, it's a lot of training. You mean like the average person at like the airport or something? Yeah. Like who yeah. might be Or like maybe in somebody fitness. that goes to the gym, gym. three times yeah. a week and gotcha. does something. Not like the that. average airport. Yeah, person yeah, yeah. Sorry. I said airport yeah. and then yeah. I was like, no, no. <laughs> that would thought, be the average. I just thought of everybody. Yeah. yeah. They would do a oh, year's worth of training yeah. one more. weekend. Yeah. More. 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 It's rough out there at those yeah. airports. I know. Yeah. So they got to, let's say, a minimum of like, two hours a day that you got to do. So 10 hours a week that you have to distribute just to the physicality of it. Those people that are not being paid professionally also have nine to five jobs. So you have all of that time. Some of them have families that I got to take care of. So they have that. So where is the time that they're going to be able to do the mental, emotional, cognitive work? It, it just makes it very challenging. Whereas if you go to a competition like a, you know, a triathlon, for example, you know exactly what it is, even though it's a lot of work, it's like, a one four hour block over a weekend. So you can distribute some, you know, easier sessions where you're filming yourself and getting off the bike and doing that. But if you got to learn double under snatch, handstand walk, j like it makes it really challenging to do that. So I think one of it is like, this sport is hard to be really good and mentally dialed into because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of unknown variables. To your point, I think one of the things that I've always observed is that most people don't do a good job of reviewing when they're done with a workout, with a competition, whatever it is. They, they don't do that reflection stage afterward. They, they go through the, you know, they, yeah. if they fail, they go through the grieving process, yeah. but they never go through the, the reflection stage, which is where you learn yeah. and where you learn about yourself and the mistakes that you made and how you can, you know, address those mistakes in the future. And I think that's, if there's like a, a, yeah. a nugget to take out of this, it's self-reflection self -reflection yeah. after challenging experiences well first you have yeah. to take on the challenging experience first yeah. you got to be willing to take on the challenging experience and then you got to actually learn from it learn from it yeah. when you're done yeah i think self-reflection too is painful a lot of times like if you have to look at something and be like man that got really hard and then at the end i just was not really tough enough to pick it up fast enough like the person next to me just decided to pick it up and i didn't like that sucks. Like you're kind of putting yourself down and providing criticism to who you are. I don't think most people's innate nature, a lot, I think most CrossFitters innate nature is to push themselves and want to be better and want to strive to the standard. But I don't think they're doing it by introspecting to be the best that they could be. They're just like in an environment chasing the best. That's even more challenging for younger athletes. You know, we're talking about people that are in that like 14 to 20 range and man, overcoming your own ego yeah. and taking that responsibility and, and going through that reflection process is harder when yeah. you're younger. I mean, a 17 year old Kyle would not do a good job yeah. of reflecting on my failures, but a 38 year old Kyle does a much better job yeah. of reflecting yeah. on my, my yeah. failures and sometimes even is, dwelling on but them. I think that is the process and that's why it's not, it's not a matter of perfection. It's yeah. just like, Hey, you need to keep working on yourself. You need to keep getting better. And like, Keep getting better even at the process of getting better. Get, keep getting better at just looking at yourself objectively and being like, oh, God, I really have a tendency for my leg to do this when I snatch. How do I correct that? Who can I go to to help me? Like those little things, that process is so helpful. And it, it compounds over time. It's not like you're going to see the results of doing that in three months. Like that ties back to the long game thing. It's like you work on the get 1% better every day and you hit these asymptotic curves, I, I think, it's yeah. called an asymptote, yes. right? You hit these asymptotic curves or um, Evan the used to the use the right yeah, asymptotic curves, baby. <laughs> Evan, Evan used to have the rock analogy that a rock cutter would have a big rock and they would hit it. And then like, let's say they hit it a thousand times and on the thousandth one, it, poof, it pops open. It's not the thousandth rep that did the thing. It's all of the reps accumulated in the exact right spot of doing it. And that's kind of like that accelerated growth curve is like you're putting in all these little detail boring ass things and not really seeing any result. And then all of a sudden things start to click. You're start to hit PRs. You start to build confidence. You start to get people believing in you. Then your belief starts to grow and it's like, Oh shit, it's happening. And that itself like creates this new progress curve. So I say like focus on those details and focus on the introspection, even if you don't see the like immediate outcome of them, which most people are looking for. They're looking to PR 
now, every time, like the PR yesterday. Maybe that's one of the advantages to being an older athlete is you recognize that you're not going to <laughs> yeah, PR yeah, now or yeah. tomorrow or yeah, maybe yeah, or ever. maybe ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On certain things. So for you, sure. you develop a different perspective to it. By the way, maybe this could be the conclusion to this. I, I could keep talking, but <laughs> did you guys see the Arnold documentary on Netflix? Mike keeps talking to me about it. Should we watch is it? Is it propaganda or is it good? I liked it. I maybe like Arnold. Or is more. it both? Oh uh, yeah, I think it may be a little bit of yeah. both. I'm sure it well. I don't know. How much it, shitting it, on Arnold does it do? It it doesn't do any shitting, I don't think, because it seems like it was like kind of a chronicle of his life, but he does acknowledge a lot of his mistakes and um explain So what, it's at least in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like the gro- the groping stuff of politics and the um, him stuff of politics. Yeah, like there was a when he was running for I didn't even know this, but when he was running for governor, it like you know the Me Too movement how it happened and started like yeah. taking big people down. It was like a mini version of that that Arnold was groping people on stage and being in a or in his uh, movie sets and there were like fifteen people that came out that said he was groping. So there's like a whole big thing during his political campaign, and they talked about that. They talked about him having a child with. Um, his How, nanny yeah. at the time when he was married. So I thought it was pretty cool. And it like, sh- I just only know him as like freaking last action hero in Terminator. Yeah. I never, yeah, yeah. and like knew that he ran for governor, but like, I don't know. I don't take politics seriously or I don't pay attention in politics. So watching it was like, holy shit, this guy is fucking super smart and dialed in and dedicated to what he was doing and connected and, um, Interest just so much more interesting than I ever gave him credit for because I just looked at him like a movie star. So yeah. he was talking about what his training is like now in his seventies and like what he thinks when he looks himself, and it was just like, oh, this is veteran training. Like it changes. We think of it in this scale of like we're old and Caden is young, and we're veterans and Caden is young. But fast forward forty years or thirty years, however long we live, assuming we all still love fitness and exercise in some capacity we're going to be way more veteran and the veteran process is going to be different it's like oh god i picked up this empty barbell and that's my strength work for the day <laughs> i saw into the goldrick's future when we were at uh semifinals for the team a couple of years ago and he was sick and he picked up an empty barbell and he was like i can't even yeah. hold it in front rack yeah. but then like, he clean and jerk like 350 or something i know yeah. but i saw i saw 40 years into the goldrick's future right then yeah all right, what an episode! Yeah, <laughs> baby, veterans versus beginners. That's actually not the title. That's, yeah. yeah, what are you? Also, gonna, I, I'm so curious. I don't what know. You're title. I have no clue. To hear the rest of the conversation, including the key to developing CrossFit athletes, how TTT survived as a CrossFit camp without any champions, how coaching athletes to win the CrossFit Games changed Max, and why a lack of self awareness could be holding you back in CrossFit. Check out these other clips here on the screen, or listen to the full audio version on all major podcast providers.